Once upon a time, slap bang in the middle between Sonic's early 90s cool dude attitude and Knight's mid to late 90s whimsical flamboyance, Sega threw out this boy towards the end of the Mega Drive's life cycle. I mean, putting anything out towards the end of a console's life cycle is pretty much IP suicide. You can just ask Deep Fear how they're getting on these days. But despite arriving at a ridiculously inconvenient moment, this little guy known as Ristar found himself a small cult fanbase. And yes, I'm pronouncing it as Ristar. Okay, you know, uh, respect to you if you want to call him Rystar or Restar or Joseph or whatever you want to call him, but I'm not shooting points for your team, yeah? We're going with Ristar. Big ops. As I was saying, Ristar found himself with a small cult fanbase. It's clear that for a bunch of you who did play this game ended up liking it, because anytime Sega fans start talking about forgotten IPs, this dude gets a couple of shoutouts instantly. The game itself, while featuring mechanics similar to Dynamite Heady, feels fairly fluid to play. Seeing Ristar stretch out his arms to grab onto surfaces or enemies, it definitely has nice movement to it, if a little slow at times. I'm not entirely sure if riding off of the back of a fast game like Sonic the Hedgehog would have done the gameplay any kudos by slowing things down so much, but in all honesty, Ristar is not meant to feel like a Sonic game anyway, and comparing the two I think is incorrect. Naturally, the pace is fine for this type of platformer. It has its own groove, and I'm down for that. I'd also like to say that the visual designs for some of these levels are really nice. It feels like Sega were heading towards Knights' territory before Knights was even a thing, you know? You can clearly see with the art direction in Ristar that Sega were itching to try new things outside of the Hedgehog's IP, and they had a certain style in mind. But anyway, we're not here to talk about the game, we're here to talk about the main character himself. So, who is Ristar anyway? Well, we're going to find out in a minute, but before we do that, I'd like to send a very big shout out to Kat Katoshi for backing me on Patreon. Thank you so, so much for supporting me. I honestly cannot thank you enough. You are wicked. And yo, if you're interested in joining Kat Katoshi, please check the Patreon link in the video description. All support is greatly appreciated. Trust me. All right, let's get back to this thing. Eh, you should probably expect spoilers. As far as storylines go, things with Ristar are a little confusing. Not because the story itself is bad or anything, but because for some reason, Sega of America decided to change the entire storyline from the Japanese original release. I have absolutely no idea why they chose to do this. I mean, the story was fine as it was, but here we are. We have two storylines for Ristar, thus doubling my workload. Sick. Okay, so the original storyline for the Japanese release is as follows. Located in the fictional galaxy of the Valdi system, planets are being taken over by a mind-controlling space pirate named Kaiser Greedy, which sounds like the name of a Wu-Tang Clan member. I feel like I do that all the time. Anytime I come across a weird sounding name, I always say it's a Wu-Tang Clan member. Anyways, Kaiser Greedy takes over the minds of each planet's leader and forces them to obey his every command, slowly in turn ruling the whole galaxy. On the planet of Nair, the locals who are fearing the impending doom of Kaiser Greedy start hoping and wishing for a savior. Their prayers reach the star goddess Oruto, who awakens one of her children, Rista, to fulfill their wishes, and Homeboy sets out to stop Kaiser, freeing the elders of each planet and restoring peace to the Valdi system. Now, tell me, what was wrong with that? Did the story not make sense to you? Did you not understand the insanely complex narrative that Sega of Japan had written for this game? Because for some bizarre reason, Sega of America looked at this and went, oh, no, 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 no. In the American version of the game, the Valdi system is still under threat from Kaiser Greedy, but everything else has changed. The star goddess Oruto doesn't even exist in this version. Instead, Rista has a father, who was the legendary hero of the Valdi system. His ass got captured because I guess he wasn't that much of a legendary hero, so his son Rista had to step up instead, not just to save the galaxy from Kaiser, but also rescue his idiot father too. If you're asking me which one I prefer, I'm going to go with the Japanese original because it places more emphasis on the fact that Rista was born to be the hero here. Residents of the Valdi system pray to his mother Oruto in the hopes she could send someone to free them. Rista was chosen and sent. It's on him because it was meant to be on him. In the Western version, Rista is in the shadow of some legendary hero who failed at his job, so now Rista has to clean up the mess that his father was supposed to do. It doesn't quite carry the same level of duty and destiny that the Japanese version has. Not that I'm hating or anything, it's just a preference, but I'm overanalyzing it anyway, so let's just leave that there. Despite which version of the story you personally gravitate to the most, the main gist of it remains. Rista has to free each planet's leader of their mind control before stomping Kaiser Greedy's arse all over the pavement. Visual design. Furries. 
furries, man. You know, you take an animal and you throw some human-looking tings onto them and boom, you got yourself an anthropomorphic animal. People been doing that shit since the dawn of time. I mean, they did it with Sonic, and I think that went over pretty well with everybody, didn't it? But now you're sitting in an office at Sega during the 1990s, and you're trying to come up with a sick one again, but instead of an animal, you have to pull off the exact same procedure with an object as simple as this. What do you do with this? Animals come in all shapes and sizes, so you've got plenty to work with. But an object with five points that is technically considered flat when looking at it from the front? Oof. Your artistic graphic designing ass is working overtime for the next three months, bruv. Sega really had very little to work with though, because the second you start messing around with the base level shape, you're essentially losing the whole star motif, so you gotta keep that shape intact as much as possible. And because star images are often considered flat, what on earth do you do when you're placing arms and legs onto this thing? Sega's answer was... a black ball. Just a black ball, throw a black ball behind the star shape and the arms and legs can come out from that instead. And you know, I'm going to be honest, I don't like this as a solution, I think it looks a little jarring. But, if I'm still being honest with you, I can't figure out any other way they could have done this. Seriously. Rista's main design point is the star shape, you can't get rid of that. But when attaching limbs, you're so limited in options that simply putting a black spherical object behind him is likely the best choice you have. Especially if the character's whole skill set is to stretch a set of those limbs, you need to be able to show that clearly. I don't hate the design though, that's not what I'm saying here, I just think Sega kind of wrote themselves into a corner when they designed him, they didn't have much leeway with it at all. I think Ristar looks decent enough, and his colour placements are actually really quite nice. Keeping him locked to three colours, yellow, black and white, means you're not putting too much onto him, and for such a simple design that's the best thing you can do. The arrangement of these colours also makes sense, with yellow holding down his face while black limbs connect themselves to white clothing items. This allows the focus to be initially drawn towards his head, but when his limbs start doing their stretchy thing, you can see them clearly from the rest of his shape. They stand out when needed. So it's not a bad design in terms of colour, it works really well in that regard. Rista can even be considered to have a very memorable design, despite his simplicity. With only one game under his belt, he's gone on to be remembered for years. I wouldn't call it a bust by any means, but I still stand by my opinion that overall, it is a little uninspired, even if Sega were limited with options to begin with. Personality. I think what was interesting about Rista was that despite the limitations of the Mega Drive's hardware, Sega programmed Rista to speak in this game. It wasn't too common to have characters voice acted back then, with Sonic's own games not really using any spoken dialogue at all, so to see Rista do something a little different was nice. I mean, he wasn't speaking full-blown sentences and having in-depth conversations, it was mostly just a short phrase here or there to give his personality a boost. He only ever said little things like, come on, before a level started. And, uh... Look, look, okay, look. I know this is not meant to be considered lewd in any shape or form, alright? I know, I know. Okay, this is just my own dirty mind that's been stuck in the gutter for the last 30 something years, but I can't hear Rista say the phrase Play with me. and think of anything else but sexy talk before a porn scene. I'm sorry, I can't. I hear that phrase and I'm like, oh god damn, oh god. I'm not checking rule 34 in this, I'm not doing it. There's some lines, bruv. I've got to have some, you know, hey, where was I going? Porn, uh, personality. As far as personalities go, Ristar seems to be a charming, cheerful chap. He smiles while he's out on his adventure, and he gets serious when it's time to knuckle down and take on a boss. There are a few moments programmed into the game where Ristar will have a specific waiting animation depending on what is happening around him, such as trying to cool himself off when he's located in a warm area. It's just neat little additional things to help give the guy some identity. I think for its time, this was a pretty important thing to include. Sonic had dominated the 90s, and this was Sega's first big in-house IP to release after the Hedgehog. They knew they were going to have to fill some very big shoes, so it seems like they tried to push the boat out a little more and get Rista doing things that Sonic hadn't done. The extra idle animations, the inclusion of a voice, all these things helped to give Rista a head start in forming his personality. Despite wanting to try something new and different though, you could almost feel some uncertainty from Sega. They weren't quite sure if they were going to alienate their audience too much by making the jump from Sonic to Ristar. Sonic was a cool dude. What type of character should Ristar be? It seems like there was a push to make Rista feel more wide-eyed and curious than his hedgehog counterpart, but Sega didn't want to dribble the ball too far away from having a cool dude vibe about him in case they lost their audience. So it feels like Ristar mimics Sonic's personality at points to try and keep the atmosphere in the same ballpark. 
Things like striking the same sort of pointing finger pose on the title screen, for instance. You boot up the game and this is the first screen you're going to see. As a child who is a fan of Sonic, you're going to want to see something that feels familiar, otherwise you might not take to it. So they got Rista pulling a Sonic-esque pose on the title screen. I mean, in the American version, they actually edited the faces on the character sprites so they would appear more serious, which naturally feels more like something seen in a Sonic game. It's clear while Ristar does have his own charming adventurous personality, he was slightly shackled by being in the shadows of a pretty big mascot. And when a company doesn't want to take too many risks, they're going to limit their creativity a bit for the sake of their audience. If they were to release a new Ristar game today though, I'd be interested to see what direction his personality would head in. Normally when I reach this section of a Who That episode, I either talk about how the character is important to the series they're from, how important they might be to the gaming community as a whole, or how important the character was to us as players. This time, it's a little different, and seeing things from a different perspective has opened up a new way for me to view the importance of a character in the future, and that new perspective is the importance of the character to the creators themselves. See, Ristar was nice. His game released at an unfortunate time, though he likely wasn't guaranteed to get a huge series because of it, but in true cult status fashion, he earned himself a strong loving audience that cherish him to this day. You ask a Rista fan why they like him, and you're going to get a nice, warm-hearted, positive response. The importance of Rista to his fans is present in their replies, so I don't need to analyze that. I get it already. I'm a fan of Nights into Dreams, so our fan bases have shared similar experiences in the past. And actually, it was the subject of Knights in the first place which brought me to the realisation that Rista holds a unique sense of importance with Sega themselves. Back then, during that point in time, the Mega Drive was at the end of its life cycle and the Sega Saturn was coming in. Sonic Team were gearing up to make their first big 32-bit splash on the new hardware, which would come to be Knights into Dreams. Speak to any Knights fan who has also played Rista and they will tell you there are some similarities in atmospheres with those two games. And that's when I realised how important Rista was to Sega during the transitional period. Sonic the Hedgehog had been their winning formula for years, but the 32-bit era was on the horizon. It was the perfect opportunity to try something new, but were they ready for that? Were Sega prepared to really step away from Sonic for a minute and get creative on a brand new IP? Ristar's importance lies in the fact that in hindsight, looking back, he was Sega's bridge between Sonic and Knights. He's that missing link that is not often considered, but I feel it's something we should pay attention to now. The game was the first time in years that the creative teams at Sega could express themselves outside of the Sonic IP, not entirely free to stray too far from what was expected of them, but free enough to do something a little different. And I don't say that in a negative way either. Sonic is a strong brand with such a massive fanbase which I love and respect myself, but I'm talking from the angle of a creator now, someone who themselves actively strives to create things. For example, this very show who that is a creation of mine. I created it to talk about characters that I find interesting. But every so often, stagnation creeps in, and I'm going to want to, and I'm going to need to try something new. So, I made sideshows on my channel that let me express myself a little further beyond the boxes that who that confines me in sometimes. The same can be said for Sega. After four hugely successful Mega Drive games that raised the bar each time, Sega had earned the right to try something new. As creators, they did a lot with Sonic, but the limitations were beginning to set in. They needed to spread their wings a little bit, as all creators should do. It's healthy. And when Sega took their very, very first few steps outside of the Sonic IP, they took it with Ristar. It may not have been a financially successful step, it may not have set the world on fire like Sonic did, but it was a crucial step in allowing the company to see if they had more in them than the Hedgehog. It was the dawn of Sega's most creative period, an era in which Sega welcomed creativity and allowed their department to experiment and try new things. And before they set off on this journey into the uncharted waters of a 32-bit era, there was Ristar, a swan song to the Sega Mega Drive and a sign of creativity that would lead them forwards all the way through to the Dreamcast. Ristar's importance lies with Sega as a games developer and sets a checkpoint in time where you can literally pinpoint the moment Sega removed the weighted braces and cut loose a little with their creativity. They opened up to possibilities and freedom for expression, and as a creator myself, that freedom is the reason you started creating in the first place. Conclusion. When I was deciding who to review first after my long hiatus, I gravitated towards Ristar for the sole purpose that I needed to start off with something simple. 
I wanted it to be a character I at least recognised, but the main reason was I couldn't throw myself in the deep end. I didn't want any long storylines to deal with or a complex character arc that I needed to analyse. I just wanted to start off with something nice and simple to get things rolling slowly again. I chose Rista because he was familiar enough to me without being too demanding. But as I spent time writing this episode's script, it made me realise just how crucial this character was to Sega's history. Overshadowed though he may be, Ristar is that vital though often unrecognised bridge between Sega's 16-bit onslaught of super successful Sonic games and their 32-bit breath of fresh air and the chance to paint upon blank open canvases again. Ristar was that idea, the idea to do something more beyond what people expect of you. And as I realised this about Ristar, I too saw the similarities in my own circumstances. I love what I do, but I'm a creator and I need to create beyond the walls that confines me sometimes. I started this video because I wanted something simple to work on, and by the end of it, I found the strangest level of understanding that I didn't expect to find in a game centred around a little star boy with stretchy arms. I never gave Ristar much credit before, mostly seeing the character as another forgotten IP because his series is virtually non-existent beyond the 16-bit era. But I feel different now. I feel in hindsight I can see what they were doing with him and why he mattered to the creators at the time. And for that, I appreciate Ristar in a completely different light. I'm not sure if everybody is going to understand me on this. Perhaps you need to be a creator yourself to understand the importance of trying something new every once in a while. But if you do understand where I'm coming from, then perhaps you'll start to see Ristar in the same light I do now. Yo, what's going on everybody? Thank you for tuning into this episode of Huda. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up because that's going to help the video and the channel in the process. And if you're new around these ends, please consider subscribing as well. I will appreciate that immensely if you stuck around. But um, anyways, listen, I want to send a massive shout out to my Patreons who are actually funding the productions of all these videos that I'm doing at the moment. People like Kakatoshi make all this possible. Thank you so much. And if you want to support the channel and the content as well, and you want to be like Kakatoshi supporting me, please head over to the Patreon and give it a look and consider supporting me on there too. And uh, one last thing, if you want to catch me outside of YouTube and that, I'm on Twitter and the Instagrams to catch me over there if that's your kind of thing. I've been DJ Valentine, thanks for your time, take care, and I'll see you all again real soon. And yo, if they don't know about me, let them know. Safe. <laughs>